What's up, and welcome to the Not So Cool Kids podcast, episode 50. We're uh, titling this one Quack, Quack, Quack. And I, I don't know... I really love you. <laughs> I don't know if you realize why, but it's because we have uh, actor-comedian uh, Sean Weiss on with us, uh, best known for his role as uh, Josh in Heavyweights, of course. Uh, and, and another Disney uh, phenomenon, which uh, he played Goldberg in uh, the, the Mighty Ducks films. So uh, thank you, Sean, for coming on. You are on correct about those two things, for sure. <laughs> I mean, he's obviously done a lot more, which, which I can't wait to hear about, because I, I hear you're doing stand-up now, which I've dabbled in recently. And, man, oh, interesting. That, was, that was like... Um, I don't know. It's a lot harder than improv, is it not? Yeah, stand up is uh, it's a, it's a lot harder than improv because it's not a, a team sport. Like in exactly. improv, it's all about you know working off the other person, and in stand up, that person is you know he doesn't exist. Your your balls are out there, literally uh, twisting in the wind um, on the stage, and you've got. I, two- I had no idea you saw my act. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, well, in a fic- in a fictitious. Oh wait, maybe it's it's in a literal term. I don't know. Um, but you know, when you, when you've got to write, you've got to de- you've got to perform, and you've got to deliver jokes. And it's there's a night there's like a weird like dance you have to do. And if you don't get it just right, it yeah. comes off as like showy and less. Yeah, um, you're right. Like, you know, Stand-up like thinking off the top of your head. You have to hone, and uh, yeah, you're. I mean, you put it perfectly. It is kind of like this, uh, this kind of dance, and very easy to step on someone's toe. You know, like you have to get good at it. So, uh, I I started doing stand-up because I was I'm working on a, a Netflix series or a series that we hope to have on Netflix called What About oh, Me? And we were making a pilot, and the show is just kind of like about my real life. Uh, trying to get back into movies and trying to become a comic and sort of reinventing myself as a 35-year-old, you know, comic. Um, and so we're making this series, and this guy calls me up from San Jose, awesome dude named Garrett Gonzalez, and actually he sent me a message on Facebook, and he's like, "Do you would you like to come here and headline a stand-up comedy show and do an hour of stand-up comedy? And uh, I was like, well, I don't really do stand-up comedy. And then he's like, well, I'll pay you $1,000. So I'm like, yeah, I could probably do an hour. Of stand-up comedy. <laughs> I can stand up and do comedy. So yeah. I, literally went to, I literally went down to San Jose with the uh, camera crew. We took our whole crew and our whole sound, you know, like our whole show. We took it to San Jose to record me doing an hour of comedy because we thought, like, I would just really suck at it and the audience would want to hate me and I'd offend everybody, like, individually. Uh, and People we figured, the show... Hey, Exactly. So we figured it'd be good television if we taped that. And I got down there and I got on stage for an hour and it like it went well. Um, That's good. It was just like it was you know I had, I sort of just basically had a conversation with the crowd for like an hour. And uh, I think it's the best way to go. It's the best way to go. Yeah, I mean that's I think why it went successfully because I didn't really have jokes, but you know I could interact with the people. Um, and uh, so all of a sudden I decided, hey, maybe I could do stand-up comedy. So I feel bad because I, uh, I don't really feel bad. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't feel bad. But uh, some people uh, feel like I kind of have a easy way into it. I'm not really a stand-up, uh, but, I, you know, I'm just out there booking shows. Uh, but I really take it seriously. Like, I want to – I'm trying to be a good stand-up comic. I'm, you know, I'm working hard at it, and I like it. It's a lot of fun. Well, anyone that that sticks with stand up, I gotta say, I, I applaud them because, it like you said, there's a lot of work involved too, too. And I think some people just think you get up there, and you tell stories, and you just, I mean, that's, I mean, I've been to so many open mic nights where the people up there that are telling stories that just go on forever, and there's no, right. you know, th- those are the people that you know you, you just feel bad for, but, you know. Well, there's a lot of people that actually put a shitload of work into it, and the people out there that are making really good dough doing it are the ones yeah. who work really hard at it. 
Definitely, definitely. Yeah, the big comics, uh, you're, you said it, who make a lot of money. You're right. And they've, they've worked uh, for a long time on their acts. And a lot of them are kind of like magicians in a sense that uh, they can they can tell you a joke or a story and they sound like they just thought about that on the way to the club appearance. But really, it's you know it's a routine that they've honed and, and worked out over a couple hundred appearances. So yeah, man, uh, that's the that's the uh, kind of the hard part about it. And nowadays, it's about I guess you know developing your own your own fan base. So, uh, but it's fun and it's uh, it's a challenge also. So I believe it. Now let's let's get a little rewind a little bit. Now you've been a part of some n- numerous gigantic pop culture projects. Just for instance, heavyweights. He started at Pee Wee's Playhouse. I mean, Freaks and Geeks, Mighty Ducks, Saved by the Bell, the new class. I mean, this is shit that I grew up with. And I was like, holy cow. I mean, one thing I really stands out to me from my childhood was watching the Pizza Hut commercial on the TMNT VHS because I wore that damn thing out. And every really? time I'd see your face on it because you, you're the catcher, you know, in that famous commercial – and I just I always thought that it was an amazing commercial, and you you're like a star in it. So, uh, yeah, it's really I was I was just telling somebody about this yesterday, literally, um, that <laughs> I feel a connection to the new movie. I feel a connection to the Ninja Turtles just in general, uh, like it's part of my childhood. And I was trying to figure out why, and I'm like, because I was in that commercial that was on that VHS. So every time someone watched uh, the VHS, and this was like when you get it from Blockbuster, it was on there. I mean, even if you got the tape smuggled in from Mexico, this commercial was on the front of it. (laughs) So it was kind of like I I almost did a cameo in that movie, sort of, VHS-wise. Exactly, and you should get some sort of uh, residuals, I think, from from that uh, movie. I used to get some good cash off of that, I'm not going to lie. Nice. Yeah, so, which project still kind of blows your mind that you were part of it? I mean, out of all those ones that I just named. Um, really all of them, because they were successful, and it's, you know, it's not easy to get something to, like, hit with a with a mass audience. So, yeah, when I think back to any one of those things, uh, the thing that's always uh, probably surprises me the most is how much people love uh, Freaks and Geeks. Because, um, mm. I, I mean... I run into people all the time now where they're just hardcore Freaks and Geeks fans. And when I was on the show, when it was uh, when it was on the air, the the atmosphere felt like nobody was watching it. I mean, that's why it got canceled. So yeah. uh, to see it just, you know, but there were so many amazingly talented people. Like I, like some of those scenes, you look at them, and, uh, you know, Siegel, Franco, Rogan. And I want to see Jonah Hill, but he, he wasn't in uh, Freaks and Geeks, right? No, that was me. <laughs> yeah, you were kind of the Jonah Hill of that, um, yeah. that, that yeah. team. Um, but what's great about it, I mean, you look back to a show like that, that was like so <laughs> yeah. ahead of its yeah. time as far as being one of those shows that people just outcried after, you know, once it was canceled, they were like pissed, you know. They were like, come on, we love this show, you know. it's. And there's so many of them like that now that have gotten canceled, like Firefly and stuff like that, that people have just, just kind of outcried for because it was such a big phenomenon, you know, when it was in its one season or however many seasons yeah. it was. And then once it got canceled, people were, like, you know, and furious about it. Futurama is a good, perfect example. That's why that mo- that show kept coming back. Yeah. You know, because the people just loved it so much. Now, but I mean, I was at uh, I was at my uh, fiance's home in Arkansas, mm-hmm. and uh, her mom her mom was like, uh, that show reminded me of when I went to high school, and it, it does that for like a whole like twenty year gap of people. Like it really does remind them um, of their own experiences. So that's like an amazing thing to do with a TV show. Like, nobody watches Frasier, and they're like, oh, my God, that reminded me of when I was married to that <laughs> uptight lawyer guy. Uh, you and he had a the dog, and he had the yeah. small dog, and, yeah. That's touching. <laughs> now, did you grow up in a big family? Was the, was the comedy kind of fueled from someone in your family that kind of gave you that, you know? I would say probably everyone in my family was funny in some kind of way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, maybe I kind of just started observing what's funny and stuff that was, you know, made me laugh. And that's kind of why I wanted to be a, uh, a writer back then. 
And, you know, it's kind of it's what I've returned to is, you know, trying to write television. So I would say everybody in my family was funny. My, uh, my mom was a very, like, uh, short-tempered Indian lady. And uh, she just used to order everybody around, and she had this real funny voice. And I used to, like, imitate everyone in my family. I kind of have to do an imitation of my, uh, my mom now. She kind of talked like this. <laughs> and, like, she's the type of lady she'd be at a, uh, a restaurant. Like, the big memory everyone talks about with her is uh, she was at a restaurant, and uh, the waitress, she was unhappy with her plate of food, and she complained to the waitress. And the waitress uh, kind of gave her a look as she walked away, and my mother said, like, to everybody, she's like, I will kill her. And she said it in a way, she said it in a way where, like, you weren't she sure. Was she was a Bond villain? Yeah. <laughs> she was a Bond villain. Like, she could very well have, like, meant it. So she was that kind of lady, and my dad was just this kind of, uh, you know, little Jewy guy. It was really funny. And uh, my brothers and sisters, one of my brothers, uh, he, like, uh, memorized the uh, Eddie Murphy stand-up comedy routine, and uh, he would just kind of recite those. So he was, like, kind of like having my own Eddie Murphy at home, being able to, to, to watch him. And, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, but these, you know, my family, uh, they're, they're, uh, my brothers and sisters left, I guess, when I was around you know, 10 or so, so the formative years were definitely spent observing all these little, like, funny people. Wow. That's awesome. I, I, I can tell you being from a big family, it's just like there's no escaping the comedy. I mean, you could literally write for hours with, with a About family. your own family. Yeah. It's just amazing. And that's the, and that's the thing that, uh, you know, basically I'm trying to make my whole art about is picking out those really realistic things and then writing about them. Uh, yeah. So, like, I don't really use my imagination much. I just kind of, like, uh, try to copy down as best as I can, like, the words that really happen. Like, when some funny shit goes down, um, I literally just try to literally, you know, use those actual words. So, I would say the best thing you to do is just carry a notepad around with you. you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, now... Now, i got to ask, like, what was... So, when you were in Mighty Ducks, like, one of the biggest myths was that when people... When the kids auditioned for it, a lot of them lied about playing hockey or being able to skate to Probably. get... Probably. I would imagine all of them lied about playing hockey. You're kind of you're trying to get a job for Disney. They're like, we'll give you $200,000. Do you know how to play hockey? You're like, of course I can play hockey. Exactly. I've been skating. I learned how to skate before I could walk. Born in Minnesota. <laughs> Originally. In the womb, I was skating. Yeah, uh, probably that's true. I mean, I know there. I mean, I don't remember the real stories about it. Like, you know, I'm sure one guy said it, you know, in an interview or something. I'm sure I knew at one point who that was. But uh, I mean, it didn't yeah. matter if you didn't, if you, if it, like before the movie, we had a three month training camp or a two month training camp. It was that's a long was time ago. Thinking. So they yeah. put everyone through camp with the idea that nobody knew how to skate anyway. So, right. It wouldn't have mattered if you lied or not. It's basically like you're going out for a job, and uh, they're like, have you ever sold cars before? And you're like, yeah. And then they're like, well, we're still going to train you. So right. They still and, train. And them. how was the training? Was it fun? It was, uh, It was. well, for me, it was, it was, of course it was fun. You know, you're playing hockey all day. Uh, but for me, it was tough because I was not a very good skater early on. Like, I, And when I say early on, I mean for three weeks I was just on my hind end. Oh. begging to get fired from the movie. I, I, I had one line. I didn't really know when it started off before we started shooting. I had one line. I didn't know it would be like a famous movie. I didn't like the sport of hockey. Um, you know, I'd rather like be, you know, I don't know, I'd rather be somewhere else. And uh, it was painful. Like I was bruised up and, uh, you know, whereas other kids, I um, can't, can't remember who. I want to say Josh, uh, Josh Jackson. I want to say within like a week. He was skating around, doing a little, you know, backward skating and could do a spin or so. You know, there were some people that were more natural at it. Uh, I was not one of them. And then they started shooting pucks at me. Like, it's like, as soon as I figured out how to just stand there without falling down for five minutes, they started taking slap shots on me. Oh, God. Like, can I, can I just get a bearing, please? Uh, I just want to, yeah, thanks. And, and they're just hitting <laughs> Hitting the, the um, fire at you, basically. A, a couple times I hurt myself, uh, like a groin, just like a little groin pull or something. And I'd be so happy because, uh, you know, I really had the injury and I'd get to not play have, have to play hockey for like two days. They'd send you to the, to the doctor. 
uh, you'd have a driver and then maybe some lunch afterwards, you know. So, yeah, I was hoping to be injured at some point. <laughs> you were like, please, please. But please. hockey camp was really cool because I have memories of uh, just having some really cool hockey people around. And uh, hockey's a good sport, and there's a certain camaraderie between the players. Uh, and after the movies, we'd go on a publicity tour, and that was one of the most fun parts because we'd go to different cities promoting the, the films. And uh, we'd get to go in the locker rooms. Oh, my uh, God. So, yeah. Hanging out with hockey guys and that was actually one of the fan questions. Um, we had someone actually today wrote in and asked. Uh, let me see here. Nicole Mary asked, uh, "Were there any perks?" Uh, Wait a second. Which Mary are we talking about? <laughs> Nicole Mary. I don't know. Nicole Mary. I don't know. Whoever oh, that Nicole is. Mary. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I know her. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Any Disney perks, special treatment from being in their films? Uh, obviously, that was a perk. I mean, you get to go. For sure. There were a lot of perks. Like, I used to be, I just would call up Disney, like the front desk, and be like, hi, I'm Goldberg, can I get some tickets? And they'd be like, yeah, sure, let me transfer you. You know? Wow. Try doing that now. They're like, who? The wrestler? Goldberg the wrestler? <laughs> the wrestler. <laughs> yeah, and they were pretty nice to us. They definitely took care of us. Uh, what kind of perks? Um... Well, I'm talking about this publicity tour that I just mentioned. I remember staying at, like, the Beverly Wilshire Hilton in my own suite. Uh, like, there's just this huge room and just ordering everything off of room service. Oh, my God. Uh, for a week. That was That's a perk. Amazing. And, you know, they paid well, too, so. Yeah. I'm trying to think of anything, like, that'd be, like, not that obvious. Now, she also asked, um, who was your favorite kid or peer co-star from the Ducks franchise. Can you repeat that question? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Who was your uh, favorite kid peer? Oh, I thought you said, who, what, what was your pay grade? And uh, <laughs> what was your pay grade compared to who was your favorite kid? It was completely different answers. Yeah, me. totally different. Okay, so who was my favorite person? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, like uh, a co-star, I guess you could say. Oh, favorite co-star. Uh, that's an, just an odd question. No, I... When I look back, uh, I have love and respect for all of them. But I did have kind of a best friend while we were making the movies, and that would be Matt Doherty, the guy who played Averman. Um, you know, it's just like there were 15 of us, and different people found different pockets of friends. And he and I probably spent the most time together off set, just hanging out, doing stuff, going to movies or whatever. You know, Very cool. Trying to get you all. And... Um... And Giovanni Cairo asked, um, do you still keep in contact with a lot of the, the cast, and is there any, um, you know, word of doing possibly a fourth film? I know Joshua well, Jackson... Uh, those are two questions. You do know those are two questions, right? That's two questions. Right. It's a loaded question. I'm just double, okay. you know, I'm just shooting folks uh, at you. Yeah, I keep... Facebook now helps people keep in touch now. So, whereas, you know... A couple years ago, there would be no contact. Now, a, a few of us have gotten back in touch, and we're kind of just friends on Facebook and stuff. Um, and are there any plans for D4? I hope so. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I, I would love to make a D4. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, I heard, like, you know, there, there was, there's always stories in the news. You know what I mean? But it, yeah. if you believe everything you read, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so... There's a barbecue that I keep talking about just so I can have a nugget to give people on interviews like this. Uh, but there's going to be a barbecue uh, that the main producer is throwing in, I think, September. So oh he's the God. kind of guy that if there was going to do it, if there was going to be a D4, I'll tell you right now, he's the kind of guy to be like, hey, everybody, come to a barbecue, get his duck call out, you know, and then have like 200 people there that were part of the movie family as he, as he, uh, was the term he used, uh, just through an email, just an, an email invite. And, and so I just think he's the type of guy that would do that. Um, I think it's 50-50 at this point. But it'd be fun, right? Oh, People my God. People want to see uh, another doc movie. <laughs> I don't know. Hell yeah. Joshua Jackson mentioned it in like an article uh, when he was being interviewed. And I know it's the 20th anniversary, so I think it's time to uh, oh, wow. to relight that fire, you know? Is it really 20th anniversary? Holy Moses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
feels like it was 1992, so it would be like 20... 20, 20 yeah, a lot. Yeah, uh, maybe. Carry the, I'm not very good at math. Math Clearly. <laughs> well, you know, either way. I could use the word, Disney. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, I'm just saying. How often... Now... I got I got I got approached to do the adult version of Did the. You really? Get yeah, the hell man, out of here! Like, uh, I feel like I've done my part to you know not dishonor the uh, the system too much. You know, like I could have done worse. <laughs> I could have done worse. I could have yeah, actually true. peed instead of just tried to pee. I'm kidding. Um. Anyway. Uh. Yeah, that would be a great, an excellent possibility. So you definitely, we definitely would have one ticket sold with you. Is that, is that the yeah, case? That would be at least two seats because I'm a large guy. So. Oh, you actually bought? You, you would buy two seats. Where do you put the armrest? Just right up the crack. Right, right in the crack. I would. No, you got those ones that move now, so you could kind of like put it down when you're that's, when you need. That's what I. Them. That's what I was thinking after I said no. that. I was like, it's probably a lifty. lifty. <laughs> a lifty majigger. Um, now, has it been challenging to distance yourself from Goldberg, or do people just go love it and they and you embrace it? Um, I have never really made an effort to distance myself uh, from Goldberg. You know, it kind of uh, it, it kind of just faded off, faded away. Like when I was a lot younger, um, people used to come up to me all the time in the streets, and I, you know, I looked different. So uh, I've never really tried to get away from it. Um, in fact, if anything, I'm tr I've been trying to use it to like get my fans to come out and see my stand-up shows. So uh, yeah, I mean, it was something cool that happened when I was, you know, younger. So I try to take advantage of it, you know, because it was it was a really positive thing, and I try to keep it a positive thing, you know. And uh, I think it, it's not easy to to get your to get word out there that you're doing shows and stuff. So if I can use, you know, find a way to talk to people that know me from there, they might, you know. Want to want to see what I have to say stand-up comedy-wise? Yeah, th there you go. So, one more Mighty Ducks question, and I promise I'll kill the Mighty Ducks questions. But how would you rewrite the sequel? Being a writer, being a comedian, what would you yeah. do? Man, you know what? You're you're actually a really good interviewer um, because all of your questions have made me think a little bit and. I have put off that thought for a while because I've been thinking about. I am a writer, right? Like, yeah. how what? How would I write? How would I write it? What would that story be? And every time I start to think about it, I'm like, I, don't, I can't think about this right now, just because. You know. <laughs> uh, but now you're actually putting me on the spot, and I don't know. I mean, I would try to just make it uh, lifelike instead of being like a Disney drama. It would just kind of be like pulling back the layer to see what these kids have been up to. And then, and, you know, figuring out, like, clever storylines um, to write around it. But I guess um, I would almost do, do just the obvious thing, like, Charlie's the coach. He has to, you know, he gets – that's what they do in movies, right? They just kind of repeat it, repeat the storyline. So just Charlie's the coach, and, you know, I'm like the, uh, the guy who's supposed to teach the goalies. You know, I'm like the nutrition expert. I don't know how, you know. And uh, I think that would be the natural way to do it because that's – if any, if any of the fans would go see it, that's that'd be why they were going to see it, not to like get some new Star Wars storyline. They'd be going to see like what's up with the ducks now. So I would right. probably try to make it, you know, as realistic as possible. And I don't know, maybe at the end throw in some kind of like apocalyptic uh, zombie, uh, you know, sequence, <laughs> and maybe some kittens. Spoilers. Yeah. Spoiler alert: There's a zombie apocalypse at the end of Mighty Ducks Four. <laughs> That's a really good question, and if I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna sit. Down, I'm not gonna say tonight because then I'll be lying to you. But I'm gonna sit down and think about that. And if I really do think of like a really cool spin on it, I will uh, definitely get at you with that, so you can let your fans know at least my uh, my Heck opinion. Yeah. yeah what would absolutely. be your uh, D four? You must have thought about that. Well, you know, I I would uh, equate it to uh, the way the new Muppets movie or the first one with um, Jason Segel. Yeah. Sure. Where it's kind of like, uh, let's go on a trip to find what everyone's doing. Kind of like type of thing like you're talking about, but like a longer montage of like, you know, let's go here, let's go here. But now we got to right. go get the coach, you know. Yeah, that'd and, be Mighty Ducks meets, uh, what are those Chevy Chase, Fletcher, what are those Chevy Chase movies where he goes on vacation with his family? 
Oh, right. Yeah, National Lampoons. You'd have it be Mighty Ducks Go on Vacation or something like that, where we were all just in a, in a journey together. That'd be phenomenal. That'd be phenomenal. <laughs> I love it. goes to Hawaii, and then they just they go to Hawaii, and there's no ice there, so... If that's the storyline, then that means I get to go to Hawaii, so I lo- I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just watched the second one the other day um, because I was trying to, like, uh, prepare myself for this interview, yeah. and I completely forgot about, like, the inner city um, kids with uh, that play, um, like, stick, stick hockey in the school <laughs> right. and how they school you guys into becoming champions. Right. Um, and I just thought to myself, are there any inner city youth hockey leagues that are <laughs> springing up? I know it just it just seemed odd to me that that was the, the choice that Disney made. Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't thought about that in a while either. But, you know, that's, uh, I mean, what kind of statement are you making right there? Like, I mean, there's the whole thing about, you know, uh, Black people don't uh, don't play hockey. I mean, what what like what is the message of that scene? Like, what are they? Yeah, I have no idea. I forget I, like how they. I really, loved, I really loved the characters that it introduced, so it worked out well. <laughs> what uh, what were what was like the main lesson that they taught us? Like, what was the you know don't crack the egg as you pass it to each other lesson? <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm still trying to is gain the uh, the. Does that have to do with toughness? Did they? Did we go there to get toughened up? Was that what it was? I think you were. Yeah, you had to be tough. You had to get uh, the knuckle puck toughness. Okay. Oh yeah, and then we got knuckle puck. You got the knuckle puck out of it. So there you go. Right. Oh yeah, now uh, that now I remember because those were. Uh, I get Keenan played Russ, right? Yes. Yeah. So those were Russ's uh, buddies or family or, or something like that. They were Russ's boys. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And he, and he just shows they up to as Russ's crew. Russ's crew was I the believe. 1996 yeah. crew was a really cool way to refer to a. a <laughs> and then I mean I I saw bits and pieces of the third one only because I felt less connected to it. It was like the first one was amazing. The second one was like Ghostbusters 2, where you sure. still love it. And it was amazing. And then the third one came along, and they went to college, and something happened where I don't know what happened. But yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, I, it's been a while since I've seen them, but I I feel like I agreed with you when you know they were happening. That Mighty Ducks. I mean, look at. I think ultimately movies get made for different reasons. Yeah. Mighty Ducks one. Um, the group of people making it. I think. Uh, well, Stephen Herrick, the director. Like he was the director, and I think he had a real specific vision for the uh, you know how it should look and the ambiance of it, and the the, movie, the whole movie had kind of a golden tone. Uh, you know, the second movie it was made. The first movie was made to be like this great piece of children's art, I think, and the second movie was made as a business. Uh, you know, that but I, that you know, I, I don't know. It just seems like what it was like. And the third one, uh, I think what happened was they're just trying to include a lot of characters. Because I guess they feel like you know they need to introduce new characters. I think the I mean the I mean were the kids from the second movie. There were a lot of newer ones in the third one, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there were in the second one even. I mean there was like they introduced. I mean a new goalie. I was like, what? They're introducing a new goalie. Goldberg is the only goalie. Okay. We can't yeah. introduce a new goalie. That's it. No, I don't think so. But then you know it turned out to be the girl that looks like. Um, Jennifer Lawrence, so I actually thought that was who she, who it was when I watched the second one. I was like, I gotta go back to IMDb. Wait, and who did you think was Daniel Day Lewis? Is that what you said? <laughs> no, Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, Jennifer Lawrence. I'm sorry, I had cars driving by. I, I heard very what you just said. <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis was in so my Jennifer Day Lawrence. Lawrence. You thought which girl? Like, uh, which girl did the you think was like Jennifer Lawrence? Yeah, the goalie. The um. Oh the, yeah, yeah. She, uh, she looked like Cologne. Jennifer Lawrence. Cologne, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had a very amazing, I will give you this tidbit, I had a very amazing crush on Cologne, and it was very heartbreaking to uh, to go to work every day just to see her effing my character over. <laughs> but you got a lot of screen time with her, so it worked out well. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that means. I remember one scene where I was trying to get her to eat bad food. <laughs> 
that scene I do remember. <laughs> Excellent. She went on to do like uh, she was a, on a cooking show. Am I correct? As your research found that food. extensive. Oh. Yeah, I, 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 I honestly, I, after I stopped, I stopped after finding out it wasn't Jennifer Lawrence. And I was like, nope, yeah, I not going to look into it. <laughs> <laughs> but you, hey, I, I, I looked you up. I mean, I'm like, hey, Goldberg, need to find out what Goldberg's doing. Yeah, well, so, when I get, uh, you know, when our show gets a little more figured out, we've made a pilot, and we're, like, shopping a pilot, and... You know, writing yeah, four episodes amazing, and stuff. I, just, I love the concept. I love the idea, and I think it's it's really uh, interesting. Yeah, I, I, would love, I would love to, uh, you know, count on your support, like, when we get, uh, when we have more stuff to show people. Yeah, absolutely. Back on and talk to you about it. Would love that, man. Would cool. love it. Now, um, so, Heavyweights. we got to talk about that a little bit. That's a John Apatow uh, co-wrote that. Was that where he found you for Fe Freaks and Geeks? Uh yeah, that's well, that's where we met. Okay. I can see. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, freaks and geeks, I think happened uh, about four or five years after that. And it was like that's a totally different situation. You got heavyweights, you know, basically a movie that I remember going. Something about this just does not seem right. <laughs> I was a big heavy kid when I was. When like, I was are they rewarding? Are they talking about being a fat kid's okay? And they're the, yeah. And that's, yeah. I, I, I was more like way. going. I was more like going. Why are they being so mean to the fat kids? I mean, <laughs> that's wrong. They want to eat. Who cares? You know, like I'll be I was, honest with you, man. I I had a little bit of the same kind of guilt, like. Just running around the country as if it was just awesome to just be a, a fat guy eating uh, fast food. I had yeah. a, a little bit of guilt about it, uh, but yeah, I didn't. I, mean, I didn't hear the last, the rest of what you said. But uh, it was, it was interesting having that kind of influence um, on. He like, I, right after the movie was over, I went to an actual fat camp that was the place that I think was the uh, inspiration for for where the actual movie took place. Okay. So I went to Fat Camp right after making a movie about Fat Camp. Fat Camp. <laughs> and were they like, hey, are you the guy from the Fat Camp movie? I really they don't appreciate it. Yet. It, wasn't, it hadn't even come out yet. Like, oh. literally, I was like, rap Fat Camp movie, boom, check into Fat Camp. <laughs> That's how fun it was making that movie. Is I was like, uh, now that the movie's over, how do I get, how do I get myself back into Fat Camp? And then, I uh, love it so like, much. Well, I want to do the real thing. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. And a lot of the things that happened in the movie actually happened there. Like, there was a guy that snuck out. We were, it was like, the camp was in Ferndale, New York. It's up in the mountains. And there was a guy who took a hike uh, to a Taco Bell, which must have been 10, 11 miles away, in the middle of the night to bring back a bag full of tacos. And I don't think, I, I, he was probably gone for two days. We thought he had died, honestly. His name was, uh, oh his name was but yeah, some of the th some of the things that happened really did happen. It was so odd. Uh, like there was just a lot of food smuggling. See, yeah. that, I believe that. I fully believe yeah. that because I'd be one of those guys who'd be like, You'd find a way to get a cheeseburger. Yeah, or send yeah. me a care package, someone, and then you would. And we ended up eating weird things like uh, tums, the mixed berry <laughs> tums. We would get our parents to send those things in because that's like the closest we could get to a lifesaver or like a candy. Oh Lord! Um, after a while, I think the uh, the people at who ran the camp were catching on. They're like, these fat kids are eating these mixed berry tums <laughs> as their candy. Like, there's no way every one of these kids can have that bad indigestion. So I think by the time I left, or shortly shortly they, thereafter, they changed their policy, and probably you could just have some Pepto Bismo until one fat kid probably overdosed on that and ruined it for everybody. <laughs> I hear it's a true thing. If you eat too much Pepto Bismol, your your tongue will turn black. <laughs> this is a legit thing. Like my oh, really? in laws went to Mexico and they drank water there, but and so immediately that's what they went to. They were like, Our tongues are black from the Mexican water. Yeah, what I but would it think. turned out to be Pepto Bismol overdose. Oh my God! 
I would think uh, if you drank too much Pepto Bismo, you might have a black tongue from something else you did that caused you to drink so much Pepto Bismo. <laughs> it make, would make your tongue turn black. A if that's a real thing, I'm, um, I'm startled. And I wonder how much you have to drink. Like, what are we talking about? A, a, a box, like a couple of Peptos, a few, six cups? What are we talking about? It's got to be like, I'm, I'm assuming, like, they must have really, really had to um, drink Pepto Bismol, <laughs> like, out of a, like, one of those hurricane glasses, you know, with a straw. <laughs> you just kind of tip it over and it just pours itself in. Yeah. <laughs> right. I do know what you mean. Yes. Uh, now, why gravitate towards comedy? I gotta ask you this because you do comedy, you do com comedic shorts, films, stand up. What is the draw to comedy? What what is that? Is something you love? Who are, who are some of your inspirations? That's a three. Uh, I I just think it's something that comes na uh, something that comes natural to me, uh, and it's because of this. When I was a kid. Um, my mom got me into uh, show business. She took me to see a manager primarily because I was essentially a smartass. Um, like, I was the little kid that would say smartassy things. Um, you know, like, I would ask, you know, an adult, hey, how's your sex life going? And when they'd be like, what? I'd be like, that bad, huh? Um, oh, Jesus. Yeah, and it was I was just really rude. But when you're young and you say, like, rude shit like that, uh, some people, you know, call that talent. Where they're like, hey, this kid's like a, you know, I think he's, you know. He's, he's, uh, he acts like an adult or he's fascinating or whatever. So I just kind of – I think that's what I've been doing is just trying to say just naturally rude shit my whole life. And in some weird way, it's, it you know can get a laugh on occasion, on the rare occasions when you're not just annoying somebody. Okay. So uh, on that subject, because we're, we're on the subject of comedy, two, two things um, – one very sad. I mean, we got Robin Williams passed away. Yeah. What are your What are your feelings about this? I mean, here's a comedic icon that I've looked up to. I know for for years, and uh, you know, what, what's your thoughts on it? Uh, my thoughts. I just can't even believe it. Like, uh, can't even believe like uh, a guy like Robin Williams, who's one of the most famous comedians and richest comedians on earth, would kill himself. And yet, I'm um, still hanging on for another day. I don't understand. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense that he would, that he would do that. Um, so, yeah, I can't wrap my brain around it. Um, but he was a huge part of my childhood, man. Like, uh, Doubtfire, uh, Good Morning Viet Vietnam. Heck yeah. My dad used to quote that movie. Uh, so a lot of his movies were part of uh, my childhood, and it was, uh, it was a shock. And... I don't know, man. It's it's interesting to see how see the reaction. Uh, like one of the greatest comics ever, like one of the funniest men ever that could sit down with you know Charlie Rose and just be funny for an hour on Charlie Rose, which is not an easy thing to do. Uh, it, it was weird that that guy was so so upset, and then also that when he died, people were just kind of uh, talk, just obsessed on talking about how he died. Right. Like, oh, that sucks. You do all this work and you do all this legacy. Okay. And the story on the news is, uh, you know, committed. He was so depressed. You know, when he passed away, I think the first thing I thought was, oh, oh, yeah, what a loss. Like, what a loss to the world. Not, how did he die? I mean, yeah, I don't get that either. Now, the other thing, though, this week, I got to say that this is, is making the rounds on the old Facebooks, is, is this challenge, this challenge. Ice water challenge. Oh, the ALS challenge. Yeah. <laughs> what? What? What is the? Uh, what's the appeal? Why do you think people are are jumping on board with this? And uh, you know, have you done it? I think it's. I think the appeal is it's funny to watch your do your buddy uh, get a, a ice bucket thrown on him. I got <laughs> called out on this thing by uh, you know this guy that's you know that promotes. My stand-up tours with me, and he's kind of like my comedy tour buddy, this guy named Garrett Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew I got tagged in a video, but I didn't know why I got tagged in a video, and I didn't even know that he'd called me out. Like, nobody ever got at me or texted me and was like, hey, this dude <laughs> called you out. So I just missed it. Would I have done it? Probably not. Or I would have just gotten to it, you know, in two weeks. I uh, think Vern Troyer had, had the best one so far. Oh, he I'm going to look at it. I, now oh, that you say sure. that, I, didn't, I mean, I don't even know what it is. I, I'm so out of the loop here. 
I, I should I tell you what it is? Because I don't well, want to. I, mean, I, I get what it is, but I don't know. Like, how does it become money? Like, how does a guy getting um, doused with ice water then turn into cash? That is <laughs> like, well, what I think the deal is that you have to donate money after you get doused with water. So it's like every single person who's done this has given like. You know, fifty bucks, hundred. I don't know. I don't even know what the amount so is. So the person who gets the ice dumped on them is now the guy that has to send in the money. That's why I, I didn't get it. I was like, this can't be. This can't be it. <laughs> this seems like a reverse. You're calling me out. You're a friend of mine, and you're calling me out. You're gonna douse me with some ice water and then steal my wallet. <laughs> We're not friends. Vern Troyer, though. Vern Troyer had the best one so far. He put, put a cookie in his mouth. And poured milk over his his head, like oh, lots wow. of milk. Yeah, no, that sounds like a turn on. Not only <laughs> sounds like a turn on, but it's a if you're into that thing, <laughs> who isn't into that? Fern Troy, yeah. sexy guy. Hold him now. Do all kinds I, of stuff. I got a, I got a question for you now. Have you had any surreal Hollywood moments? That you just look back on and you go, man, I wish I could capture this with a snapshot right now. Like meeting Harrison Ford, something like really crazy, like you were in an elevator and Harrison Ford farted and then you like got off and, you know, anything like like funny, like something happened and you were like, I can't believe that just happened. Why am I not recording this? Uh, yeah, that would be called just my average day. <laughs> see, that's why we need to see this Netflix show, people. Get yeah, oh my god, fantastic! Um, I don't know. I just uh, I just did a. Uh, I went to Arkansas, and you know my stand-up act is kind of blue. I'm used to working just blue-ish. Like I don't really say the f word, and I don't really talk about dirty things. But you know, I'll let one slip. I'll I talk about adult-themed things, and uh, definitely with a point of view. And anyway, I went to Arkansas, and I just did a, a stand-up show at a church. And I literally, I was like, I, li I had to throw away all my material. I'm like, I can literally say none of this. So I, I, I was doing, it was, I was kind of donating a performance for doing a fundraiser, and uh, I literally had to come up with 30 minutes of oh new material. God. Oh my! God. I opened with some Jew jokes, and I don't even know why I did that. It was not on my <laughs> list. It wasn't planned. And then I started talking about uh, Asian laborers, which was also not on my list. Of things to talk about. That's the natural I, progression, I, Jew jokes, Asian laborers. Well, it was kind of a new type of church, uh, kind of a laid-back atmosphere. In the men's room, over the commode there, I just said commode like I'm British, uh, over the toilet, there's a picture <laughs> of Elvis, and it says King of Rock and Roll. Wow. So this is a kind of church. <laughs> that is it. That, that sounds like, wow. I, I, I can remember one of the worst places I ever did improv was on a bowling lane. <laughs> yeah. For a women's bowling league championship. Oh, wow. And I can it's tell you it did not about? go well. <laughs> did not uh, go I, well. That, I guess that would be your story you wish you had a camera for. Yes, that would probably, no, well, I don't know if I want to share that one, um, but I guess I just did. So, I'm just looking now. This is the first time I've taken my eyes directly off you, and I'm just kind of looking around your room, kind of seeing what kind of books and shit you got on your wall. <laughs> uh, that guy in the in the drawing is that. Oh, right here. Yep. That's Gaffigan. Jim Gaffigan. Oh no, no kidding. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good guy. He was so cool. I, my wife and I oh. went to uh, one of his performances here uh, in in the Detroit area, and the guy stayed. Literally till the the lights were turned off. There was a thousand, I'd say more than a thousand people in a line oh, wow. to to get an autograph and a picture with the guy. Yeah, you know what's what else is there to do in Detroit? I'm just saying. Where, where else was he gonna go? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's a very nice thing that he would do. I don't I don't know him, but I've like seen him out places. Yeah. He's a really funny, nice, nice person. Yes, it was like really nice guy and it's funny thing. What's that? Has he come on your show yet? He has not. He has All not right. Come on well, I'll have, to, I'll have to try to get him on your show. I would love to get him on my show. I'm calling you out, Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> this is the uh, the new ALS challenge. I don't want to say ALS. I wish I could. Wish I'd have said three different letters. But it's the new <laughs> challenge. Uh, you come on this show, and I'm calling you out, Jim Gaffigan. You got to come on the show, and then you got to pay him fifty dollars. 
<laughs> and then pour milk on your head with Vern <laughs> Troyer. Uh, <laughs> that would be awesome if all that happened at once, like multiple things. Dude, you happened. never know. Uh, you know, that's an, an idea could have just been born. <laughs> I think it's a fantastic I think idea. We should try for this. I think we should hit him up on Twitter and do what we got to do. I think <laughs> he'll definitely do. Oh yeah, you can just Skype it. And yeah. uh, what else you got up there? Is that a collection of uh, lighters? Are we looking at? What is this? No, called? no. What's that Rubik's collect, cube? I'm a true nerd. I collect Pez dispensers. Um, wow. Yeah. This, you're making me hungry. This whole interview. I wanted a cookie before now. <laughs> That's Pez. We got some Pez. The sad uh, thing is I've eaten all seven, the Pez eight. that's come from every single one of those packages, which equals a lot uh, of sugar binges. And what is this other collection that's right behind your head? It's clearly, is that shot glasses, I'm guessing? That is shot glasses, which is funny because I don't drink at all. I'm, uh, I don't drink. Well, yeah, I drink wine. Frank, you probably would have broken half of them. <laughs> exactly. Shot typically don't drink, I think. That 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 was a funny story because when I um actually started collecting those, it's because I needed to find something every time I'd go somewhere. I was like, I need a little something, you know, like like in the the movie um, what was that with um, oh shit, I don't even remember. But anyways, he collects rocks everywhere he goes. But sure, a little set dressing. What's yeah, that? A little cup full of pencils or something. Yeah, I like that. yeah. good idea. Exactly. So I that's when I got the shot glass. So, you know. But Makes what sense. are your unsaid and unknown nerdy hobbies? What are your what's your niche? Do you collect? Do you do you have anything nerdy that you do? You gotta hold on. I feel like this is your best question yet, and I just didn't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, somebody just decided to take out the lawnmower. Oh, nice. They say that's the best time to do it is after, uh, you know, after the sun goes down. So out sure. west here, the sun has just gone down, and some guy was like, yeah, I'm going to go mow, mow my lawn. <laughs> mow my lawn now, right? Well, well this your is... question was, like, what are my things? Is that what you were getting at? Yeah, yeah. What are your, you know, you know, nerdy, unseen, unsaid things that you... I want to say I'm kind of a... Uh... Might be a big like a overly feminine collector of sunglasses. I feel like that's a little uh, feminine part of me. Is that like you that's know? That's pretty good. That's you know, how you as a man while you're buying a two hundred dollar pair of Ray Bans, you're like, is this uh, you know, what do I look like? <laughs> what do I look like to a, to, a, to somebody else right now? Uh, so that's one thing. When I was a kid, I used to have all kinds of those things. I was very much into like sports and stuff, um, baseball cards, comics, and. Uh, I thought, when I was buying comic books, dude, I thought I was making an investment into my future. I thought that someday if I ever needed some cash, probably had $100,000, $200,000 worth of comic books. Right. And I went to sell those comic books, and the guy gave me, I think, 2 or $3 a pound. He goes, okay, oh what are you going to do? I'm going to bring a scale over here. I'm going to put your comics on the scale. And I, mean, I had some, some good stuff in there. I had like 40 uh, Death of Supermans, the one in the black plastic uh, wrapper. I had a oh, lot yeah. of those. Oh, yeah. Uh, and baseball cards, too. I mean, it's just bad investments. I made a lot of bad investments, man. I spent a million dollars on, like, baseball cards and compact discs. And then they come out with an iPad. <laughs> right, exactly. And then now you can keep all of your nerdy hobbies in one place, but you can't right. really touch them. They're just digital. <laughs> yeah, but everything you just, all the collection you've just amassed is now just, you know, dust collector. It is. Um, it totally is. And I've told my wife that. I go, I've got to stop this Pez dispense. And she's like, oh, it, it's fine, Brian. You should, just, you should keep doing it. And I'm like, I don't know. I shouldn't really. Because what are our kids going to do really? What? I just, I don't care. I just want you to keep doing it. Cause it's fun. Dude, you never know. Pez might be one of those things that are, uh, yeah, maybe they're, maybe that is, a, it's, it, maybe that's going to hit. You never know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. I just, I just picture myself one day like someone is gonna come in in one of those hoarding shows, and I'm just gonna be my baby and I are gonna be, you know, stuck under a thing of Pez dispensers, and <laughs> you know, and it's gonna be a sad moment, and everyone at home is gonna go, oh, and you know, 
Like that's my fear is literally <laughs> grounded. If that's what you're worried about. I would, you know, I think you're in pretty good shape. If that's your worst fear, you're doing well. <laughs> that and sharks. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are you yeah, working on right I used, now? Um, I used to have. You know, sorry to cut you off, but I used to have a. Uh, I used to own ev well, probably every kung fu movie that Jackie Chan ever made, and I'm talking about the like the Mandarin ones. That uh, you could only order in, and we didn't have, we couldn't get on the internet at this time. I'm talking, you know, five years before, like everything was just online. Yeah. And I had to back down. I would call like video stores in Hong Kong and Malaysia and like all kinds of weird places to try to get that one Jackie Chan movie that I couldn't get on tape. And by the time they sent it to you, like shipping, and you know, you're looking at 200 bucks for like a, by the time you got a tape in your hand, a VHS. Absolutely. Yeah. But Last Dragon. Was probably the, one of the best movies I believe. You know, even it don't it didn't have Jackie Chan in it. Oh, <laughs> you got me. I was like Last Dragon. How can I talk about? I'm the biggest Jackie Chan fan ever, and then I don't. I've never seen Last Dragon, and there must be a, a movie that he did called Last Dragon. No, 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 absolutely. Trust not. me, there's a movie he did called Last Dragon. <laughs> First dragon, Last Dragon, Second Dragon, Last Commode Dragon. Yeah. He's done all the kinds of dragons. Yes. Well, uh, well, okay. So the question I asked was, though, what are you working on right now with the series that you're working on? Or we are working on uh, writing more episodes, and oh. uh, we're very close to being able to, like, go into Netflix with, with our full pitch. And I mean, we have 52 episodes mapped out. We have the whole four years, like 26 hours of television. Um, and I think that's what a company like Netflix requires these days, is because they like to buy chip, they like to buy shows in whole chunks. Yeah. Uh, and they like to be able to, you know, read what it's going to be like, th you know, two, three years, you know, three years from now. So we have 52 episodes, uh, like I said, 20, 26 hours mapped out, and it's basically, I'm not really, I mean, it's kind of all true stuff. Um, the first five minutes of uh, five minutes of every episode kind of talks about me being a kid. And uh, starting in movies, and it's about my kind of rise to like, uh, you know, being on on TV in LA and being in movies. And then the rest of the episode kind of deals with me um, later on. And we it, we kind of look at the, the parallels be between things how were how like how th how things were and how they are now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just kind of like a true story serialized kind of thing. Um, but there's a story in it, you know. There's like a uh, classic, you know. Hero mythology built in. So, right now, would you be playing yourself, or is this like? I would uh, like. To, I would totally like of yourself. Uh, I would like to. It is both. It is both. But I would. The hope is that I'm playing myself because I think. Uh, I think I could probably play myself better than. <laughs> than most. <laughs> right, but um, you know, if they were like, bam, here's some table, here's some money. And we want this guy to be in it. I'd be like, well, listen, uh, you know, let's see what let's see. I'm open to uh, I'm open to doing business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's hard to it's hard uh, because so much of the show takes place now. Um, it'd be hard to have just somebody else do it. Maybe if I was telling this a story about you know 20 years ago, then I could get somebody much younger. Um, or even ten years ago, and I could get somebody younger to play me. But I think it'd be weird to get somebody my same age to play me as my same age. That would be strange. Just because I'm I'm an actor, I'm trying to be a working actor and be on TV. So right. you know, that's that's the hope is that it's me doing it. Now, uh, what would your um, dream role be? Um, you know, outside of this project, what, who would you want to work with? On what type of project? What medium? Man, probably I would like to work on Paul uh, something with Paul Thomas Anderson that's uh, a little more goofy and lighthearted than his last movie. Uh, only because I don't think I'm that good of an actor to like really pull off something that really would need a brilliant actor. So I throw in that clause about it being a little more lighthearted and goofy just so you know it's feasible. But Paul Thomas Anderson, there's so many people, actually, that I would love to work with I, that I admire. I just saw Star Trek Into Darkness the other night. And yeah. J.J. Abrams, man, did a great job on that movie. Uh, he'd be one of the people. 
Um, just, there's a lot of people. I'd love to work with like a guy like Larry David someday. I'd like to stand in uh, front of a camera with him and do a little uh, do a little improv work. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I believe. Uh, well, that's oh, you're awesome. frozen. My internet's getting choppy, so now once in a while I get a picture of you where you're like. <laughs> I'm doing that um, robot. Yeah, I'm just like, are you okay, dude? You alright? <laughs> I just had a stroke. No big deal. Um, that's that wonderful. Um, what do you have? Dial up over there? What's going on? Bing bong, bing bong. Brrr. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you're doing that on purpose right now or that's totally real. I, don't know. <laughs> I think that might be real. I don't know. Um, yeah, man. I do kind of have to get out of here soon. Do you ever want to call me back or continue this on a new on another episode? Yes. Um, that's that's sure. what I was just about to say. Is uh. I, I, we got to thank Sean uh, Weiss for coming on with us. Thank you uh, for having me, and I mean that. It's nice to come out and uh, and talk to a cool guy like you. You have a lot of great questions. You're a great interviewer. Hey, thank you I very really much. Enjoyed, I enjoyed the time. I really appreciate it, and uh, come back anytime, uh, especially when you get that on Netflix. would love it. That would be awesome. Thank you for saying that, man. All uh, right, I'll, man. Keep an I'll keep in touch with you on Facebook. All right. Take it easy now. Okay, I, hope you, I hope you had a good talk, too, and uh, we'll touch base soon. Awesome, man. Thanks. All right. Have a good night. All right. Take it easy. All right. So that was Sean Weiss, uh, you know, from the Mighty Ducks. Uh, everyone knows him from that big role, but the guy is now transcending into something totally cool, which is uh, he's doing stand-up. He's obviously got the show. He's pitching to Netflix. So, you know, comedy is one of those things that's a really hard thing. Even the, like, most dramatic actors say that that's, that comedy in general is is a much more, you know, tough medium to, to handle. So the the fact that he's th doing that and, and, and really trying, I mean, that's amazing. I, I've tried saying it myself. Very difficult. Uh, I mostly do improv now. So, um, anyways... Uh, moving on a little bit of the show, um, we've got uh, something you guys uh, know very well as the Collector's Corners, um, where you kinda, we kind of share something a little bit unique from uh, our collection. One thing that I um, ha have brought today is, uh, this is really cool, guys. Um, if you're a big fan of Ghostbusters, um, the 30th anniversary was just uh, recently... Um, happened and it's just a it's a big thing now they came out with a an LP which was a glow-in-the-dark LP of uh, the original song and I don't know if it had the full uh, album on it or not but I I instinctly had to go out and check now I went to my local um, uh, record store because I'm just starting to get back into records and uh, I found this this is um, the original soundtrack that they uh, released for the 30th anniversary. And the cool thing about it is, you know, it's, it's got all of the original music. It's got the Ghostbusters theme song, obviously, but it's got Cleaning Up the Town, Saving the Day, In the Name of Love. I can't wait for it. It's got all this. If you're a big fan of Ghostbusters... You're going to love this. So I, I had to pick it up. I couldn't find the glow-in-the-dark one because I think it was kind of like a collector's item thing got snagged up real quick. Uh, so that is my collector's corner for the week. I am just getting back into vinyl because um, I think I shared this on one of my last shows, but uh, a buddy of mine was at a garage sale, and he was just tooling around, ended up finding... Um, an old school uh, Batman classic Batman uh, theme song uh, disc and uh, or see, record I should say disc. What am I? What is, what is this? Uh, CDs? No. He found the the record and he and he said, "My buddy Brian would love this." This is actually a guy who I do improv with. So. He, he came to my door, he delivered it. I was like, oh my God, dude, 
I don't have a record player, but I love this gift. Thank you. And I immediately went out and got a record player. So now I've got the record player, and I'm dying to play this. This I just got this the other day, unwrapped it, had to take a look at it, and I just can't wait to play it. So that's my collector's corner for uh, this week. I, I don't want to give you know too many of the other things because I've gotten in the last like three weeks. I'm sorry, by the way, to everyone. I had a couple of uh, shows where we had to reschedule um, due to either something happening with uh, technical issues or um, something happening with um, m my own schedule. So completely my fault. I apologize telling you guys that up front. Um, but in that meantime, I had gotten a lot of really cool stuff, um, and I can't wait to share it with you. I don't want to give too much away. So, a um, little recap, since I haven't seen you guys in a while. Um, I did go see Guardians of the Galaxy. Really, really loved it. I mean, phenomenal uh, film. But... When I, when I was done with it, I asked my wife, I said, was that Star Wars? Because it felt so much like Star Wars the first time I had ever seen it. And I said, man, it was fun. It was adventure. It was funny. It, um, it was uh, dramatic at times. Uh, and it was mostly fun. I just remember walking out of there and going, okay, I, I would buy this movie you know, because it was just a phenomenal film. So I really got to give it up to um, all those guys who decided at Marvel, decided to, to chance it with the Guardians of the Galaxy, which are characters that, you know, in as far as my childhood is concerned, I don't really remember them, you know, but I've been introduced to them, and I love I love every single character uh, in this, uh, you know, I guess you could say rebirth of the Guardians of the Galaxy. So, I mean, I saw that film. Uh, what else did I see? I saw Lucy. Lucy was um, a little bit more disappointing. Um, if you guys are going to go see it, it was one of those films where I felt like the concept was phenomenal. I, I love the idea of it. And really, the first, I would say, 30 minutes of it was really exciting. And then it was a lot of Scarlett Johansson doing ro robot face, which is not like her. Because I see her now in like the role as like... Um, uh, I'm sorry, the name escapes me. Um, from the Avengers. Sorry, from the Avengers. She, she was um, phenomenal, especially in the last Captain America movie. Amazing. She, I mean, she could really hold her own Marvel movie. But in this film, it was like a lot of robot face and going, I'm going to kill you now. And it was like, what? Like Scarlet? What? I mean, maybe she did it for the money. Maybe she thought that was a really cool role. I don't know. But... Um, Oh well, I mean, it was it wasn't that great of a film. But and then I saw Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, I am a big Turtles fan. I mean, if you watch the show, we've had Robbie Rist on, who did the voice of Michelangelo. We had um, we had um, Daniel Bravo. I think Dan Let's see now now I'm losing my mind a little bit. Um, yeah, Daniel Bravo from L.A. He does custom uh, TMNT, old school TMNT movie costumes. And the guy is like, and this is his hobby. This isn't like something he like does for a, well, he kind of does for a living because now he's sold a lot of them. But it's not something he started out to make money off of. It was something that he loved to do. And be and he was phenomenal. I mean, the guy is phenomenal at it. If you see any of his, his uh, get-ups, they look like the authentic um, TMNT movie uh, turtle. So, anyways, I digress. I saw the film. I love the originals. And then 
I said to myself, I got to take the sting out of this film because I think um, my friend Johnny Flynn put it best is I had to remove myself and all the years that I love the turtles away from it and say, what is this movie's purpose? And it was to entertain kids. Kids are much more, um, I hate to say short attention span compared to our generation. Like we could watch a scene where Luke and Leia and Han are having like this really deep conversation that would bore the tears out of the kids of today. They would be like, no, where's the, you know, where's the lightsaber battle? That's all they care about. So my point is, is it was a lot faster. It was a lot, um, I, I'd say like, like kiddier. It was kiddier. Is that a word? Kiddier? No, it was a lot more for kids. It was, it was for kids. Now, now the one thing I didn't really like is what they did to Shredder. They really messed up Shredder. Here, here's a guy who was in the first movie, I mean, in the original movie, the live action, this guy was ominous. I mean, he didn't, and he didn't need to have any huge giant weapons or anything like that. The guy had claws coming out of his fists. He had an awesome, like, like chrome thing on his head. He had a mask. He had the scar. I mean, he looked badass, okay? And then it's like Super Shredder from the second one just decided to make a, a, a reappearance in this new movie because he's like in a robotic suit where he can shoot um, knives out of his fists, but they also retract back to him and... It was unbelievably like, oh, really? Like, God. I mean, I I loved many parts of that film. But that one, I just, I, I couldn't believe. And they were fighting him halfway through the movie. So, you know, at the end, it was like the big battle scene in the original one, the live action one. They're on the roof. They're fighting. It was really tense and be like, oh my god, they're actually going to fight now. Oh my god, it's so exciting. You've built all the way up to it. You know, slowly but surely you're building up to the big fight scene. You're like, what's going to happen? Oh my god. And this one, he's literally in half the film. Um, and and it just, I don't know, it didn't work. Um, and I'm not, I'm not hating on it because everyone else was. I'm hating on it because it lost the heart that the original one had. This one's more about fun, selling toys, you know, being kid-like, and and that's fine. If that's what that's the movie that kids are gonna watch and love, it did great at the box office. So for me, who cares what I have to say? But it's just as an opinion from a guy who who really had to you know, had to suck it up and tried to say, hey, what is this movie all about? It was a tough one to get through for me. So those are some kind of movie picks for you. I also said Let's Be Cops, and I'm not going to say too much about it, but it was a, it was a great film. Uh, very funny. Um, I think it had to have been the guys who were in the film, the, the two main roles, um, those guys had to have uh, written the film for themselves because <laughs> the characters were just too amazing. So, um, so anyways, um, I really, really uh, thank you guys for tuning in this week. It's episode 50. Oh, my God. We've, we've done 50 episodes uh, since we started last year. Um, I really hope to get Brent on one of these shows because it feels like um, he just hasn't been on a really long time. So if you guys want Brent to be on a show, you, you got to bug him because uh, he's got so much going on that he, he's uh, been unable to come on. So we, we want to try to get him on, um, on one of these shows. 
Um, if you'd like to be a co-host of the show, all we ask is that um, you commit to it. Um, you know, commit to being on episodes with me and talking about nerdy stuff, which is pretty fun. And um, it's not a paid gig, but um, there are perks. You get to go to some comic book conventions when we cover it and stuff like that, which is a fun thing. So if you have a nerdy hobby, um, something you really love um, that is happens to be nerd culture or pop culture, please um, send me an email, notsocoolkidspodcast at gmail.com. Go to our website, www.thenotsocoolkidspodcast.com, and write us from there. Tell us uh, that you want to be on the show, and here's why, and then explain a little bit about yourself. Uh, also include a picture, because we'd like to know what you look like. All right, so thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Um, I believe, let's see who we have next week. I had it pulled up a second ago. Of course, it's not pulled up now. But, uh, do, do, do. Um, we've got, I know we've got one really, I'm really excited about it coming up. Um, the next one we're going to do is LARP City. So if you watched the um, live-action role-playing panel that we did, we talked about LARP City for a brief moment, but it's this group of people who are working on creating a village, a place where LARP um, enthusiasts can go and be literally immersed in LARP. Um, it's quite spectacular, um, the concept. Uh, it's not going to be next week. It's going to be September 10th, and I do apologize about saying next week. It's not going to be next week. We're taking that week off. I, I've got to play catch up on getting some guests on the show. Um, but we do also have coming up Drunk Disney. The, guy, the, the guys and gals from Drunk Disney are coming on with us. And they're going to talk about their amazing uh, web phenomenon, which is Drunk Disney. It's, it's a phenomenal show if you've ever watched it. It's basically... These guys who and, and gals who are in college, and you know they're my age basically, and they watch Disney films that they love. They're absolute fans, and they talk about them in in pure fun fashion. And funny things happen. They happen to be drinking the whole time, so that's kind of a fun element, um, which is why it's called Drunk Disney. But it's just like the things that they say or everything that you've been saying for years that are up at here, but you haven't said it, and they verbalize them in such a funny way, and they're such a great uh, group of people anyways. So um, they're going to be on the show, and they've got tons of other um, web videos out there which are really funny stuff. Um, so check them out as well and then come back for the show. That one's going to be on the 27th. Um, of September. So, um, we need to reschedule a couple of episodes that we missed, but um, thank you so much for coming on again, and um, please keep sending us ideas for shows. We uh, really appreciate it. This one was actually um, suggested by a fan. Someone said, hey, why don't you look up and see um, you know, what some of uh, the Mighty Ducks guys are doing now. So I immediately said, Goldberg was my favorite character, and, and, and now that I've talked to Sean Weiss, he's a super nice guy, um, you know, he's even bigger, uh, I'm a bigger fan of him, and I would love to see a stand-up sometimes, so, um, so yeah, so that was a suggested, um, you know, idea for the show, so thank you so much for uh, the people that, that sent that in. Um, all right, till next time. Have fun, be uh, geeky, and um, don't don't hurt yourself when you're doing things. Is that is that, is that a thing to say? I don't know. I've I've got no fun catchphrases. So so long.
farewell and I bid you adieu.